These presentations are a five-part series on the function and dysfunction of the disc of the temporomandibular joint. This part one is titled TMJ Disc Derangements, How and Why, and it is an attempt to share our understanding of why disc derangements happen and how to prevent them. Part two is titled The VHF and Jawbone Geometry. And it is our understanding of the concept of the vertical holding fulcrum and the mathematics of occlusal reduction from maximum intercuspation to centric relation. Part three is titled Centric Relation and Equilibration of an Orthotic. It describes capturing centric relation and then adjusting an orthotic using the vertical holding fulcrum and jawbone geometry. Part four is titled Equilibration of the Natural Dentition, and it covers the steps required to alter the natural dentition's occlusal surfaces to achieve centric relation. Part five is titled Establishing Anterior Guidance and Adjusting Lateral Interferences, and it is about the final steps required to achieve total patient comfort. So let's now discuss the rationale for why we think disc derangements happen and how to prevent them. For the purpose of simplicity in this discussion, we will talk about one TMJ. It is understood that there are two and that motion in one joint certainly affects motions in the other joint. The problem is the frequent anterior displacement or dislocation of the disc. The question is, why does it happen? And secondly, can it be prevented? Two definitions are required for this very short presentation. MI, or maximum intercuspation, is the precise fit of the teeth at closure to contact. Detrusion. That is a condylar position which is further away from the eminence than when the condyle disc relationship is at the central fovea. This increased space is maintained by a protrusive disc posture relative to the condyle. This illustration depicts the four uh, relative movements of the condyle versus the eminence, whether with sertrusion being closer to the eminence, detrusion being further away, and then obviously protrusion and retrusion, which we're all familiar with. Here we see the ideal or normal relationship of the condyle articulating with the central fovea of the disc. The problem arises when the occlusion demands a greater space between the condyle and the eminence, as depicted here. This is, by definition, a detrusive condylar posture. The function of the disc is to be moved forward to occupy this required space, thus giving stability to the arc of closure to MI. Anterior displacement of the disc is usually caused by two things occlusion, and parafunctional activity. So the first risk factor for the discs becoming anteriorly displaced is an occlusion which requires detrusion. In other words, the disc condyle relationship is not at the disc central fovea. The disc's posture is to some degree protrusive relative to the condyle. Here we see the condylar position requirements of MI for this particular patient. The casts were mounted to centric relation, and then the casts were placed in maximum intercuspation, thus demonstrating where the condyle in this joint has to be for the patient's teeth to fit together precisely. Her occlusion requires some protrusion of the mandible and quite a bit of detrusion of the mandible. What is true for this joint might be very different on the other side. 
This conjular position, and therefore the mandibular posture, is the responsibility of the superior heads of the lateral pterygoid muscles. They fire on closure. The controlling engram is continuously edited via force data input from the teeth. This beautiful dissection by Julio Terrell shows the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle and the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. The superior head attaches to the head of the condyle and to the disc. The inferior head attaches to the neck of the condyle. The inferior head is active during opening and protrudes the condyle. The superior head is active during closure and its function is to control the posture of both the condyle and the disc during closure to MI. The second risk factor is that the force applied during bruxism is sufficient to degrade the integrity of the disc's form. In other words, the distal rim is progressively flattened. It is progressive because the superior head must maintain the conjular detrusion space as required by the occlusion of maximum intercuspation as the disc is progressively deformed or continuously deformed. Eventually, the thicker dimension of the distal rim of the disc is gone, allowing the disc to be anteriorly displaced by the contraction of the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. This is not muscle dysfunction. It is the superior head doing exactly what it's designed to do, which is to maintain the precision and stability of the arc of closure to MI. The two main modes of treatment in an effort to prevent anterior disc dislocations are to correct the occlusion to eliminate the detrusion that might be there in MI and to address those stressors which may be contributing to the parafunctional activity or the bruxism which is the destructive force. We address the occlusal problem by eliminating the detrusive requirement of MI by occlusal correction to remove the protrusive disc posture engram and therefore the potential for progressive deformation of the disc. Correcting the occlusion to eliminate detrusion without closing the vertical requires a special technique. It necessitates the correct usage and understanding of the vertical holding fulcrum, abbreviated as the VHF. The definition of the VHF is the most anterior occlusal contact between posterior teeth. This is usually the lower first premolar cusp tip in the mesial fossa of the upper first premolar. The function of the VHF is to maintain the vertical dimension during occlusal correction procedures. One uses it the same way, whether dealing with an orthotic or with an equilibration. Using this concept is essential during the removal of the interferences to sertrusion because it acts as a pivot point around which the plane of occlusion rotates as the condyle rises toward the eminence. Discussion of the vertical holding fulcrum technique requires a separate presentation because it is not a simple matter. We will discuss it under the title of Jawbone Geometry. The next presentation will be a discussion of how to use the vertical holding fulcrum and a general discussion of the complexities of jawbone geometry.